son where'd you find this welcome 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 to episode 27 of the fly route podcast i am your host anthony aka tony playboy aka fits the football team aka the boston tea party and i'm joined here by one of my best friends demarcus you got any aka's well aka i'm bored because the NFL free agency has been underwhelming to me thus far. Really? I don't think it's been too bad. I feel like a lot of the big ticket names people expected to garner the massive deals early on just didn't move the way that we thought. But there's been a lot of shuffling, a lot of movement. And so far, I've been more intrigued than not. I'll say there has been a good amount of movement. Two things. There hasn't been, there's not the quality of star we're used to seeing in free agency. There are other years where you get bigger guys moving around. But number two, I think more importantly, is the quarterbacks. We expected a lot of quarterback movement. We've seen some, but none of the top guys have gotten moved. Um, And that includes both trades and free agency. Uh, You know, we'll talk about, we'll dive into the Russell Wilson situation. Deshaun Watson, still an ongoing thing. Um, and so I that could have had ripples. I I mean, maybe if like that's what you expected, but in comparison to an average season, I feel like we've seen a lot of movement. Carson Wentz going to Indy, Goff, Stafford, Tyrod to a new place. Like, I mean, you're Andy right comparatively, Dalton. but I think there is someone counted it. And it's like 18 quarterback jobs are in question, so we expected a lot more movement. Based on that was all. But, you know, we'll see. There's still moves to play out. Teams will still keep doing things. We'll see some more surprise cuts, etc. And things aren't done yet. The draft is still like 40-some days away. There's still a lot of time. A lot of things are still yet to be determined. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm willing to give it some time. So let's get into some fly route NBA game picks of the week this weekend we have a couple of pretty interesting matchups the first one I want to start with is the Lakers versus the Suns oh I'm gonna have to say Suns so the Suns uh, have been playing really well the Lakers not so well as of late the Lakers had a late loss to or they blew out the Warriors but in general have not been looking great I mean the Warriors have been really hot and cold as well They had lost to the Lakers, but then beat the Jazz. So it's like, that's not the team to necessarily gauge it by, but the Lakers have not looked great. Maybe they're still good. They're still a playoff team, et cetera, but Suns. Okay, okay. Uh, I think the Lakers can pull this one out. I think that might be a game that LeBron James is particularly motivated in. Because his banana boat friend Chris Paul is playing? But also just like the Suns are... What, second Legitimate. in the yeah. West? Yeah, yeah, like it's a, it's a game that he might get up for. And this week, the Mavs and the Trailblazers will play each other twice. What's the splits on that? Honestly, I think we could easily see a 1-1 split. Um, Portland is fantastic. Dame will take over games. We saw, was it last night? He dropped 50 in the win. And again, he's doing this every time. It's the truth. And he's hot right now. He is really hot right now. Uh, but I don't underestimate the shooting, uh, how hot the Mavs can get on one particular night. I'm not saying that's why I'm not going to say pick them twice or whatever, but Portland being a little hot and cold as well, maybe someone on the Mavericks gets hot to help Luka out. We'll see. So I say a one-to-one split. Yeah, I'll take the Trailblazers twice the way they're playing right now. Uh, last but not least, this game might not be as competitive, but it's one that I'm super excited to watch. The Clippers will play the Hornets. You're excited for ball? I mean, who is not excited to watch LaMelo ball right now? LaMelo's developing great. He is proving a lot of the critics wrong. The game will be entertaining, but not good. I think that's the distinction you're looking for. Uh, Okay. I mean, the Clippers have lost some pretty odd games as of late. So definitely anything can happen type situation. But we have an exciting show for you all today. (laughs) 
We are going to get into the story of Matt Rowan, an high school Oklahoma announcer for basketball, who was recently caught on a hot mic saying some racial slurs. That seems it to was be just blood sugar. Leave that man alone. We will get there, Demarcus, and give you all an update on some hot water Deshaun Watson has very, very, very recently found himself in. We are going to get into our NFL free agency recap so far, rating some of the most effective and least effective moves that we've seen so far. Get into the NBA trade deadline as we see things getting down to the wire. It's going to be big things popping. And last but not least, giving you the RPO, run pass options segment, where we like to give you the hottest sports news of the week and let you know whether or not we are going to run with them or pass on them. And last but not least, giving a big baller's bouquet to Yusuf Nurkic for all of his fantastic charitable works back home in Bosnia. Welcome to the tee off. Oh, 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 spill that tea, sis. This is how we like to start our show off. We like to spill some tea on our favorite athletes in the crazy situations they get into. Today, we have a little bit of a two parter for you all. The first thing I want to talk about is like, obviously, you've heard of this story a little bit, but you know, high school basketball announcer in Oklahoma, actually in Norman, Oklahoma, too. Mm hmm. Uh, his name is Matt Rowan, right? Uh, the girls' basketball team is kneeling for the anthem, which so frequently becomes a point of contention on this podcast now, huh? It's ridiculous because we're like five years into the, 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 the kneeling protest and people... It, and racists still can't see that it's not about the military? They still lose their mind every single time. Yeah, so the mic is hot, the anthem is going on, and like for a person who's like, respect the anthem, I can't believe that you all are kneeling. This guy is going on a complete tirade during the anthem. He's like, fuck them, which is a bunch of high schoolers. He's like, fuck them, I can't believe they're kneeling, I hope they lose. And then about like a minute into his rant, like he is ranting through the whole national anthem. Talk like, about disrespect. Right? Right. Supposed to be standing. If you believe in what you believe in, which I'm not questioning your right to, then you should stand with respect to the flag, hand over your heart, and be quiet. It's like a minute and a half long. It's not even that long. Yeah. It uh, it is like a minute and a half long. He <laughs> is ranting for the whole minute and a half, and we get pretty far into this minute, and he goes, "Fucking niggers." Hard R. Because that's what this is really about. Yes. Hard R talking about a bunch of high school students. And of course, this goes viral. It goes crazy. And what was even worse is every time someone does something racist in public, you know the apology, the template. <laughs> they, it's like basically, we talked about it last week. Yeah, it's like they basically have a template where they're like, look. I'm going to apologize. I'm going to say there's no excuse for this. And then I'm going to give you an excuse for a this. Really shitty excuse for this. Not even just an excuse, a really shitty excuse for like, this. Yes. And me, I talked to me and my black friends and <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, having black friends don't get you out of this. And of course he says that, the reason why he called a bunch of high school girls fucking niggers is because his blood pressure got low and he has diabetes. <laughs> this is so wild. The excuses, the excuses they come up with to justify the things they do. I, I cannot shit you anymore. Like, look, he, he says, look, I will state that I suffer from type one diabetes. And during the game, my sugar was spiking. While not excusing my remarks, it's not unusual when my sugar spikes that I become disoriented and often say things that are not appropriate as well as hurtful. I do not believe I would have said such horrendous statements 
absent my blood sugar spiking. There was a very important sentence in this apology that I really need you to catch on to, DeMarcus. There was a very important sentence in this apology that I need you to catch on to, DeMarcus. Hit me. Can you guess it? The it was spiking or, or... now I, I will, I'm leaving I'm leaving a little bit of space for the people at home. The sentence I wanted you to grab is it is not unusual when my sugar spikes that I become disoriented and often say things that are not appropriate as well as hurtful. Okay. Okay. No. It, it sounds like he has a chronic condition of saying nigger. It's like his his tick is the n-word. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, ooh, when I when my sugar spikes, mm, I just can't resist it. Oh my God. Like that is a, that is really what he said in an apology. But He's no. like, yo, my sugar spikes, I gotta get the slurs off. Not not buying it. <laughs> Listen, even first off, you have type one diabetes. So this is something you've lived with your whole life. And I can't imagine that So his whole life. For your entire life, you've walked around saying the N-word every time your sugar was a little off. Can't believe that. What? Because you wouldn't be alive. <laughs> Two. <laughs> well, you live in Oklahoma though. What's he, up? he might be around the wrong <laughs> the wrong black person and not make it back to his nice little suburban neighborhood, probably. But two, if you're disoriented, why are you giving a perfect soliloquy about the anthem? <laughs> contrary to what's because this is what's happening around if you're disoriented, you're talking about, I don't know, the new the new Audi, the new heads up display or something random. Mm-hmm. You're talking about the actual anthem you are watching in the moment. How is that disoriented? It seems perfectly on message to me. It just seems like the message was the wrong one to be caught on camera or a microphone. Look, I'm I'm with you. I am with you. And weirdly enough, like the Norman High School goes on, wins the entire state championship. So like kudos to them. Very good for them. Matter of fact. And then, of course, the uh, high school basketball association starts losing sponsors because that's how this goes. Mm -hmm. Right. And people start terminating their contracts with them. They've already fired the guy. Uh, They like even put a guy that they thought it was at first on leave. Like, you know, everybody automatically got to jump on it. I'm with it. I'm with it. But I. I feel like. At this point, you know, like the calendar that people have been doing for like meme of the month. Yeah. Instead of the meme of the month calendar, I want like slur of the month and excuse of the month. Like we, I honestly think there is a large enough scandal that goes viral on something like this every single month, large enough to do the calendar. That's just sports related at that. That's just. Because there is all other kind of <laughs> vitriol and hate in this country that we could talk about, like what happened earlier uh, this week with, Atlanta? Uh, in Atlanta. But this is just sports-related hate and vitriol by people who should know better mm-hmm. at the very minimum. Like, I don't, I don't, I think it would be naive to believe that we have identified all racist people in our country. That would be a little ridiculous because some of them are polite 95% of the time. But when they went their friends, when they're at home, when they think no one is listening. When they think the mic is off. When they think the mic is off. Which, by the way, we've told you, the mic is never off. Assume it's <laughs> always on. It's like a loaded gun. The hard R comes out. Mm-hmm. Every single time. And it's, we get these crazy excuses. My blood sugar was lower. It was high. My blood pressure was lower. It was high. Uh, I took an Ambien or (laughs) (laughs) yo I forgot what the Ambien excuse was hot and Ambien had to be like yo this is not a side effect of our drug homie (laughs) no like the and and for me it's like the audacity for those words to come out of your mouth do you think I'm an idiot do you think that the general public is that stupid Uh, he was hoping I listen I condemn this language in this speech, but more importantly, it's the hypocrisy that always slaps me. It's just like, first off, you've been disrespectful as hell. The anthem is playing. If they're not talking, they're kneeling respectfully to protest police brutality in this country that kills 
hundreds, if not thousands of innocent people every year. But you're talking during the anthem. It, it, it's so frustrating. It's so frustrating. All right, here's a little alleviation. My question now is, what do you think about instead of kneeling during the anthem, crip walking during the anthem? They have a problem with that too. What? They will always have a problem. It doesn't matter what we, we do. We on our feet? Doesn't matter what we do. Shit, you you put the one out here? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, as as hilarious as that would be, I think the kneeling works. It is despite the politics behind it, a very respectable act. Um, you're not being disrespectful whatsoever. It's a free speech act that the soldiers who fought and died for our country have, in fact, fought for you to have the right to do. And some people seem to want to constantly keep infringing on people's fundamental rights, despite the fact that, you know, we are equal as humans. Honestly, perfect. We will leave it there. <laughs> Look, so let's move on to the second part of this other major T and this is Deshaun Watson, right? Mm -hmm. Some major allegations. They are very fresh. There's not a lot of hard evidence out. Generally, when we do tee-offs, we like to have significant more hard evidence to speak about, uh, you know, verified reports, et cetera. But the lawsuit that is out, well, the lawsuit that people are talking about is not even out. People do not even have the, you know, text the, of it. The like, complaint. Yes. Because like frequently we like to read complaints, like to read police reports and break them down for you all. That's like kind of part of our big tee off thing. But because of that, we are not making this like a full tee off. But we do feel like the news is so important that it should be touched upon, especially because Deshaun Watson last night came out actively up front, addressed the allegations before like they even went viral and really hit and got out in front of it and put his message out. So I feel like covering what's going on so far in both sides is very helpful to keep everybody educated as the issues start playing out and more details come to pass. Mm -hmm. Right. So first and foremost is there was a sexual assault lawsuit filed against Deshaun Watson on the behalf of a masseuse. This woman says that she was contacted by Deshaun Watson on Instagram and that he contacted her basically for a massage. She says that he then started soliciting more than just the massage, right? And wanted her to, you know, I guess, give him a happy ending. That is what's going on. She says that she did not want to do this. She says that she, in fact, left when he tried to go too far. And there are some other details that are alleged here, but I really want to see the complaint in the lawsuit before I get into the particulars of that. But regardless, she says she left and now she's suing because she has suffered mental anguish, panic attacks, depression, and anxiety because of this incident. And of course, she says that Watson, she claims he apologized over text message. This is very important to me because if he apologized over text message and you are suing him, I assume you have proof of this mm -hmm. text message. Kind of like the Antonio Brown thing where Antonio Brown st kept texting his accuser and like threatening her. And she's like, well, here are the fucking receipts. Right. So I'm interested now. These are very serious allegations. Absolutely. They must be taken seriously. They must be investigated seriously. And hmm, how do I say this? While there is a history of pro athletes being extorted in situations like this, there is also on the same coin, a history of pro athletes abusing their status mm -hmm. for things like this. So, I want to get to more of the details, both sides of it. I want to talk about Watson's response as well. So first off, who filed the suit? The attorney's name is Tony Busby. Tony Busby. And first and foremost is several reports claim that Tony Busby is slash was the neighbor of former now deceased Houston Texans owner. 
Hmm. McNair. Oh, you, you did not hear that part. I I did not know the, that. The no. look on your face is <laughs> you fucking speak, Demarcus, because the look on your face says a lot. It it is at the very minimum like a little suspect of the timing of this. We've we've covered extensively the situation that Deshaun's been going through with Elaborate. the team. Um, you know, back and forth, what he wants out of Houston. A part of that is the ownership, both the son who's now in charge and the father who was previously in charge, the former neighbor of this uh, attorney. And so, you know, I, I don't want to say that this is made up. I'm not taking anyone's side in this until there has been more that comes out. I don't know enough to take a side, and I'm always going to believe the accuser in the situation and take them at their word until it's investigated. That being said, Based on the accusation, it sounds like there. If 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 she is telling the truth, there is tangible proof that something happened at Deshaun Watson's house, right? If he set up an encounter for her to come give him a massage, even there's lots of receipts and messages and probably a payment of some kind, etc. If there is that much proof, and something did happen, and it's not that long ago, they're why saying March it? 2020. How hasn't this been reported to the authorities? Because, and I say that not because um, I think that's good or bad or better, but in a court of law, there's a higher standard to prove than in a civil court. I want to clarify something. You're not saying, why didn't she go to the authorities in March 2020? You're saying, why has she only filed a lawsuit for damages instead of making this a both criminal and civil situation. Right, because there's proof and it's within the statute of limitations. So I, I get it. If you're hurt, you hurt. But then why not totally go after the, the person who's hurt you and make sure they're punished to the fullest extent possible, both civil and legal? Okay, I'm, I hear you. So another thing that's worth noting is that, you know, obviously when something like this happens, people will dig into all parties involved. Tony Busby... Uh, Originally started off as just doing offshore litigation, contract law, environment and regulation style law, and then has now tried to transition into more of a like celebrity attorney role, right? So people are kind of like, A, this type of case you really have no experience with, no, uh, I guess, expertise mm -mm. in lit litigating it is interesting that you have brought it up. And it's, well, more so, it is very interesting that if this person has this issue that they chose you. Absolutely. That is kind of the thing. And it's important because after these, this story dropped, um, basically, Busby made the lawsuit public. But even though the document was not out, Watson had this response. I'm going to quote it. He says, as a result of social media post by a publicity seeking plaintiff's lawyer, I recently became aware of a lawsuit that has apparently been filed against me. I have not yet seen the complaint, but I know this. I have never treated any woman with anything other than the utmost respect. The plaintiff's lawyers claim that this isn't about money, but before filing the suit, he made a baseless six-figure settlement demand, which I quickly rejected. Unlike him, this isn't about money for me. It's about clearing my name, and I look forward to doing that. Absolutely. So... It seems like there was a settlement forwarded, I guess, before the lawsuit. I guess maybe a call I, to the lawyer or something. Who knows? I don't really know what standard procedure for that is. This might be another situation where we have to phone a lawyer friend. Uh, but I'm interested to see how this plays out. Busby later on said that he has four plaintiffs now. Like this is a serial issue for Deshaun Watson. It went from one to four in like less than 24 hours. So there's a lot going on here. We want to keep you all updated. We can't really speak on exactly what happened, our opinions on how this should be handled until we get some more of those details. But we're keeping you updated as we are updated. And as always, that was your tee off. Oh, 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 spit that tea, Ooh, sis. Spit that tea, Ooh. sis. Y'all, 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 it's Tony Playboy. Let's get into NFL free agency. It's on everybody's mind. It's literally all we can think about in sports news. All right, first and foremost, what were some big moves that you feel like need to be highlighted? First and foremost, I think 
if we're talking about big moves, what has happened in New England has been the talk of the town the past few days. A team that normally is pretty conservative in general and all assets of how they run their team was very aggressive in free agent signings. They doled out, I think, over $225 million in contracts over the past three days. And so that is first and foremost, the kind of biggest thing that sticks out to me about free agency thus far. Okay. Okay. The biggest thing that stuck out to me was the Bucks making all the cap moves work and getting everybody paid. And so far bringing everybody back. There are a couple of stragglers, a B, you know, Sue. And I want to say like Fournette. those are the stragglers really left over. But besides that, they brought back the team in near completion and it looks like they are ready to run it back all over again. And I was surprised because we thought somebody would have to get let go to make that work. You know. Um, we're, well, we'll still see if anyway, let's let go in the situation. I think they'll make a push to re-sign Sue. Uh, I heard an interesting tidbit about that, which was that Sue is actually negotiating his contract himself for the first time and does not have an agent. So it'll be interesting to see at this point in his career if he pushes for more money or pushes to give the team a discount to run it back. Okay. That is not something that I knew. All right, let's move on to something more concrete. The most impressive move in free agency, whether it's a whole team making a set of moves or an individual move made by a team that just changes everything. So I'm going to very much agree with you on your first pick. It's going to be the Bucks, And not just that the Bucks are able to keep so many players, but how they were able to construct the cap on how they did that. So, for example, keeping the linebackers, uh, Barrett and then Levante Davis, they're very interesting deals. They look like they're a lot of money, but after two years, the team can get out of those deals and not have cost them very much. I think the Barrett deal has three years voidable on the end of it to make the cap number look better. They did some really, really creative cap moves in addition to getting Brady to take less money again um, or, you know, to restructure his contract to let them fit this these other guys under. You know how it all goes. I don't want to get off into the weeds on that, but that is the most impressive kind of thing for me. Most valuable thing is whoever their cap guy is figuring out how to work all these guys back in. Cause that was always the biggest thing was, okay, they could do it one year, but can you put the team back together for a second year to run it back? Okay. That was big, but it seemed like a lot of teams were doing the same thing that the bucks were doing cap wise. Like we saw Taysom Hill, uh, get his renegotiated contract that's technically $140 million. But really nothing. But yeah, exactly, because it's all voidable at the end. <clears throat> it's just like the cap maneuvers were interesting. The Bucks making them were huge. But it seems like this was a strategy that we saw all around the league as everybody had to deal with the pressure of the falling cap. So I'll say it's exceptional in this instance because typically when a team wins a Super Bowl, it drives up the price of all of their free agents, especially guys like the Bucks have who have been big name guys in the past. So to be able to not just retain them, but get them back on relatively team friendly deals is a deviation from the norm for Super Bowl winners who often have to overpay their free agents, no matter what position they're at. Think of teams who always have to pay their quarterback after they win a Super Bowl. Think of the Tom Brady. It, yes, that's exactly number but one. That's just regular Tom Brady shit. That is 20 years of Tom Brady shit. But then think the linebackers. You don't think like uh, Shaq Barrett or Levante Davis could have gone somewhere and gotten big money even with the low cap? Absolutely they could have, but they valued being in Tampa Bay so much that they were able to work it out with the team, and that is just super surprising that you don't see that often. Also, Levante David looked like he got real money. Don't, don't oh, no, 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 no. He got real bread. He Not trying to say out. they didn't, but it is also team-friendly. I, I, look, he cashed out. I'm, I'm just going to say, like, his deal was the most surprising number to me. Uh, obviously, they kept Gronk, but, like, we never thought they were going to lose Gronk. Well, Gronk's only playing in the NFL for the Bucks. If he's not playing for the Bucks, he might as well go home. And that's what people are thinking about Antonio Brown as well. But the fact that he has not signed yet is interesting. So, for me, the most impressive free agency moves, the Patriots. The Patriots, uh, it's like a full instant rebuild, Right. It's just hard to say that this is not expected because, yes, the Patriots did not spend a lot of money, but that's because they did not have a lot of cap to spend in those years because they were constantly at the very top, right? They were constantly having a stacked roster, 
And this is Bill Belichick again, showing that he plays chess, not checkers. Like last year, he had that radio interview where he was just like, we sold out for a Super Bowl for like five straight years. We got to three of them. We won two of them. We got no money. I paid Cam, Mil- Cam Newton $1 million. And now, because they had no money last season, they did not try to spread these hits over a long amount of time. They took them hard in one year, especially because they had all the opt-outs. Mm-hmm. They had all the money. And you see him rebuilding his team. And I hate the people going like, look, no, I won't say I hate this. But what I will say is, yes, he has failed to draft receiving and tight end talent Mm -hmm. in recent years. But that was never something that could have been fixed in one season through something like the draft. Instead, he went out and got exactly what he needs. We know what this football team is going to be. Jonu Smith and Hunter Henry over the middle where Cam can eat because that's who Cam Newton is. Like, Cam Newton's most successful receiver he ever had was Greg Olson. Absolutely. Right? That is what we want to see. I don't disagree at all. Add to that that this is kind of a zig while everyone else is zagging. Bill Chuck wants to go back to his early 2010s offense. You're right that this was not something that could be fixed through one draft, but even looking back at last year's draft, the Patriots took two tight ends who both can't play. And so but I think what it's rounds also, did they take those guys? Um, That's the thing. It's so, not like Bill Belichick was like spending his like first, second round picks on these tight ends that no, can't play. No, that's not the arg, but any a lot of good teams find bargain talent in the draft. I mean, it's the whole thing with Brady was he was a six-round draft pick. You see people like Dax, a fourth rounder. You see uh, the Steelers always finding receivers late in the draft. Like So it, it can be done. It's a question of over a long period of time, not just this past year or the past couple years, the Pats have not been good at that particular position. And this is him saying, I have not done well here. Let me go out in free agency and fix this problem. I think it's a good move. It's a smart move. It's very good. He redesigned the entire offense overnight, essentially. In a way that plays to Cam Newton's strength. That was my whole thing for the fly route, which is why you want Cam in New England, because New England was very clearly willing to build for Cam's strength. I was I I would I did say though that it was all about the Patriots weapons then and that if they you know their weapons last year were bad and that's why a part of the reason Cam should leave but since they've upgraded of course that changes the landscape in a huge way because we didn't expect New England to spend this kind of money so fast. All right, boom bust pick here was Nelson Aguilar. Do you believe that he's going to be able to replicate last season's no, magic? No, last season was a deviation from the norm of what he looked like in Philadelphia. I expect him to return closer to that than he did in Oakland or not Oakland. I'm sorry, Las Vegas last year. Okay. I now have this one question for you. Do you think that the fact that he had Derek Carr throwing him the ball instead of full slash once changes anything? Cause I feel pretty confident that you would say that Carr is the best of those three quarterbacks. Sure. But his only problem was not, uh, uh, looks in Philly, it was dropping the ball. And he much, much, much improved in actually his drop percentage this past year with the Raiders than he had those years in Philadelphia. And if you talk to any Philly fan or you watch Philly games, he was the guy who was dropping 40-yard bombs. All right. All right. We always remember the catch that's dropped, not the amazing catch that's made. But let's let's keep it moving. I want your most underrated free agent move. So you'll probably disagree with this, but I think it's just the Packers re-signing uh, Aaron Jones. It is a huge move for them to retain that piece of their offense, to be able to run the football. It's huge to be able to maintain that relationship with Aaron Rodgers at this point in his career where he could play the Brett Favre, like, oh, I'm retiring, oh, I'm not kind of thing. But also they lost their uh, their other running back in free agency. Jamal um, Williams. Jamal Williams. And so it's super, super important to get Aaron Jones back. I think it's super under the radar because they're retaining a player but super, super important for that team and their playoff hopes and how far they go next year. Man, I felt like they needed to retain Aaron Jones, but is that really... They they paid, paid the man. We didn't expect it. And more than the franchise tag paid the man. The the key, though, is they can spread this out, which is why it's better. But again, didn't expect... These these are usually not a big spender of free agency. And they drafted a running back in the second last year? Mm Mm-hmm. And paid, paid him to the point where they lost their center. 
I mean, for all the things that Aaron has lost, I'm sure he's fine to keep his running back. Okay, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. So originally for this, I thought it was gonna be uh, Ngakwe to the uh, to the Raiders, mm-hmm. but I today something changed my mind. Emmanuel Sanders to the Bills, mm, which was a surprising cut. It, it was a surprising cut uh, for New Orleans, but like, wow. The Bills have not made many moves, but the one move that the Bills did make makes the Bills way better than they were last year. And they were already good. We think about like, okay, your weapons on the field, who has the best set of weapons? We always say Mahomes is great, but the weapons around Mahomes are otherworldly, right? Travis Kelsey, mm-hmm. Tariq Hill, it's otherworldly. Think about this. Emmanuel Sanders was a wide receiver one last year when he was on the Saints. Mm-hmm. For the most part, Mark, Michael Thomas didn't play. Or was hurt and not 100%. Yeah. Exactly. And he did work. Now imagine that you have Stephon Diggs opposite of Emmanuel Sanders and you still have little dude used to play oh, for the Cowboys. Like- that that nigga's fire. Oh, he's great. I was upset to let him go. Oh, uh, yes. I am like he is one of my favorite bargain fantasy picks forever. Just like great PPR, low ceiling guy. I'm sorry. Low floor. Low floor guy. Mm-hmm. Perfect. So I thought Emmanuel Sanders was huge. That takes this offense to the next level. Even though the Bills really needed a running back, not another wide receiver, it is great that they have just made their core devastating. It's fantastic. They'll need it to keep up with the improving Dolphins and the much-improved Patriots offense. I'm with you. I'm with you. Last but not least, worst move that you've seen so far. Okay. So this is not going to sound right, but it's it's actually a move the Bengals made. It's not a big move as far as what will happen in that division, but it just says it's a dumb move. They paid Hendrickson like four years, $60 million. But the problem with this contract is that they let Carl Lawson go, a similar player at the same position go, for the exact same amount of money to another team. And it's like, okay, what are you doing? When you look at the players, Carl Lawson had like five and a half sacks, but his top five in pro football focus and pressures on the quarterback last season was already a player who was in-house. You know how they work with your locker room, et cetera. And then you go out and you spend the money on uh, Hendrickson, who, yes, had more sacks last year, 13, I want to say, and it looks big on paper, but it's boom or bust with him, and it's a how do you how are you treating your guys kind of thing, that it has a ripple effect on when other people look at coming to your team. You see them let go of somebody like A.J. Uh, AJ Green, and you see them uh, mm, not, no re- cares about not that. re-sign Hendrickson, but re- or, not, or, re-sign, or sign Hendrickson and not re-sign Lawson, et cetera, and you start to question some of the – the back and forth between the team and the and the and the players there, like, is it really okay? I don't like the AJ Green example. Did you see recently that Colin Sexton liked the tweet saying that um, Kevin Love robbed the Cavs of 120 million dollars? Oh, I did not see that. Yeah, I feel like that could be a similar tweet that gets liked for AJ Green in the last several years of that contract. <laughs> so that's why I don't feel like the AJ Green thing is a really big comparison. Do we know that Lawson wanted to stay in Cincinnati? I I have not heard anything to the contrary that he didn't. I think it was more about the money that they were offering him. Okay. I, okay, I'm with you. I'm with you. For me, the worst move by far is Chicago getting Andy Dalton. Okay. I won't go too far into it because we are going to touch it later on, but it just, like, it is gross. It's like... Man, of all the things you could do, you just signed Nick Foles again. Well, while Nick Foles is still on the team, too. So you got to pay them both. Yes. It's just like, I don't know if he makes that big of a difference for us. If it, upgrade from Nick Foles. Yeah, I was listening to actually Colin Cowher talk about this earlier. And it was, it's not that Foles is, or not Foles, but not that Dalton is bad. He's just the lowest ceiling player they could have gotten. For this, they could have gotten other guys who are free agents, even a Marcus Mariota, who's a better fit for 
what Chicago and Matt Nagy probably need to do than Andy Dalton. Andy Dalton is a very low ceiling player for them, which is the upsetting part because the roster is so good. I, I, I honestly wish we would have brought back Mitch Trubisky instead of this. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you would think that. Uh, <laughs> Mitch has a winning record, so I don't, I, I don't think that's a super crazy thing to say, but we'll get into it later. Yeah, that's tough. That's tough. But so far, that's our wrap for NFL free agency. As the next couple of days go on, we'll see a lot more moves. We'll be able to touch back on this one more time. Boy. All right, let's get into the NBA trade deadline. It's coming up. I want to say it's what March twenty fifth. Correct. March twenty fifth. So this is our final episode before all movements will be in stone, and then we'll be talking about the buyout market. So big things are popping so far. It's been a pretty hot week. After things slowed down, there are two really big moves that I think we should talk about. The first is Trevor Ariza to the Heat. Uh, this gives us a little bit of a reach back to the tee off from last week. They basically um, gave up a second round pick. So Presty collects even more picks and Myers Leonard, who is going to never play for the OKC Thunder. Mm-mm. So basically Myers Leonard is unemployed um, and they get Trevor Ariza. Do you feel like this move changes anything for the Heat? I, I think it can. It can. It, they are still in the playoff hunt in the East. Having made this move, first off, even when before you got rid of, oh boy, he wasn't playing. He's injured. So Ariza comes, comes in. He's able to contribute to the team right away. This is the last push in the second half of the season. More than half of the games have already been played before the playoffs are, are, are happening again. The Heat happened to go on a run last year as the fifth seed, I want to say. And yes. last time we talked about them, they were in a similar position right now. I think sixth or seventh seed in the East. I think they're fourth now. Dude. Or fourth now. Yeah, dude, but they just don't lose. About where they were last year. Mm-hmm. And if they could put the pieces back together, get the right players hot at the right time, going in as a top four seed, that bodes well for them making it back to at least the second round and avoiding a terrible, terrible first round matchup with a Brooklyn or a um, Milwaukee or whoever finishes in that second spot. I think they want all the smoke with Milwaukee, but just not in the first round. I, I think they want all the smoke with Milwaukee to show that it was not a fluke the way they put them down last last season. But since we're on Milwaukee, the second large move, PJ Tucker to the Bucks. Uh, I want to say basically they are giving a pick, but getting their old pick back. It's a bunch of pick movement and swapping, but they also send DJ Augustine and DJ Wilson. Uh, PJ Tucker kind of knew he was going to have to get moved. He, was, yeah. he we, we knew way back when the rumors about Harden first wanting out came out that PJ, if Harden left, would want out of Houston. Mm-hmm. Things have really gone down the tubes. At one point, they had lost like, what is it, like 12 straight or something like it was. I think they're still on the same losing streak. Oh, I'm sorry. They're, I think they're at like 17 games, dude. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, and so based on both of those things happening, he wanted out. So I knew that was going to happen. The Bucks are a great landing spot for what PJ does. He is, I guess, would you call PJ a three and D guy? A hundred percent. He is. And that's what they need. Um, PJ think, defends basically two through five. If he has to, he's really good. Three to three through five, in my opinion. And he shoots the three really well, although not as much this year, but I feel like that is probably a lot of, lack of motivation and really not wanting to fucking be there. Well, also the offense. D'Antoni's gone. D'Antoni was one of the main guys and Maury pushing the three or layup kind of movement in Houston. And so I think based on all those things, those are all reasons why he would want to leave. And Milwaukee's the place for him. They have been shooting way more threes than they have before. They could still use more shooting. We talked about the Bucks a few weeks ago on the pod. And we and I said, hey, hold, hold on, hold on. Because the, the Bucks are a team that's trying lots of different things this season to try to get to be a better team come postseason. And we're still seeing that play out. And I think they are going to have a solid chance to be in the second round and have a shot against either. I think I would say Brooklyn or um, gosh, I'm blanking on the other 
team at the top of the East. Philly? Philly, yes. Against Brooklyn or Philly. Okay. You're saying hold on to the Bucks, then like I have like the pretty big question is does this move change your hold on to your now bullish on the Bucks? Um, I I don't know yet. I don't know yet. I am if it is a Bucks Sixer series or something like that, I I'm still 51 49 Sixers is where I'm at right now. I think it's close. It could go seven if the Bucks are playing well and the Sixers have all their pieces back, which is going to be important with the Joel Embiid injury. They say, what, two weeks? Two to three, yeah. Two to three, but... Bone bruise in the knee. Those things don't heal that quickly. There's not a lot of blood flow to that area of the body. And so if he's back, okay, I'm going to, you know, and everything's healthy and PJ doesn't quite fit, well, Sixers. But if he's back, looks good, and PJ looks good, I don't know. I don't know. I think it would be a very good series that I would probably Joel watch. Joel Embiid was of. a runaway MVP candidate, and you responded with "I don't know." No, no, no. I'm saying that. Well, I mean, then you have Embiid on one side, and you have Giannis on the other side, both MVP level guys. You have Ben Simmons, and you have then the Chris Middleton kind of guy, and then it's a question of depth for each team. I'm not saying Embiid was not the runaway MVP candidate. I'm saying when it comes to a seven game playoff series, we really get to find out who the better team is, and right now. If everybody's healthy, I'm not sure who the better team is. Okay. But I would lean Philly right now. All right. You know. You know, let's talk about the fly route for what we got going on right now. I, we're coming down to the wire. Mm Mm-hmm. What is the move that you want to see a team make the most? What is that team's fly route? So this is for Boston, the Boston Celtics. We've talked about this team extensively on the podcast. They come up quite frequently because of who they are in their history, and they have not been good this season. They have been disappointing. They've had injuries. They don't have the depth they need, et cetera. I think an immediate move that would help them make an end-of-season push to get up the playoff rankings or the seeds and give them hope for next year going forward possibly is a deal with the Kings for Harrison Barnes. So this is one of the most talked about trades in the league right now. All the speculation says that the Kings, who are a kind of fringe um, play-in team, but have not looked good at all, to be honest. I mean, they're getting better as a team, but they're not going anywhere this year. They're not going anywhere this year. They need more out of this. And Harrison Barnes is a player who's, I think, early 30s now. Has, is having his most efficient season as far as shooting and scoring the basketball in a long time and could be a really good piece for a team that wants to contend or thinks that they are a piece away from contending. I think with the assets Boston has, they can give up you know, a, a serviceable veteran and a first-round pick and get Harrison Barnes and then try to re-sign him uh, going forward to give them better chances and more depth uh, for what they think should be a team that has an open window to contend for a title. Harrison Barnes is a pretty large contract. I'm just like, who do they send back? Uh, that would be the maneuvering. I'll say all of the what I'm hearing right now is that's my fire out. I think that the Celtics should do that. I think that makes them better right away. The problem right now is the rumor, the latest rumor mill says the Kings are not open to trade, or they're still open to trading him, but unlikely to. And that... People are not sure if Boston wants to give up something to get Harrison Barnes, at least what it could take to get him. I, I, so Barnes was Barnes. I, I just don't know if they can give up the salary without giving up make the money one of their work. big three, right? Mm-hmm. But I think Boston does want to make a move. I think the collective internet has kind of bullied Danny Ainge into finally trying to do something with all those picks that he has. Mm-hmm. I, for me, right now, I'm I'm still he- highly focused on the Heat. And I think the fly route for the Miami Heat is to go get Oladipo. Okay. There's been a lot of rumors about getting Depot. We know that Depot, well, we don't know, but we have heard a lot of people speculate that Depot wants to be in Miami. And you can wait and hope that Depot then does come to Miami, but you don't want to end up in like a Paul George Lakers situation. Where, you know, he was he went to OKC and he was like, I'm going to be a Laker. I want to be a Laker. Give me a year. Yeah. And then OKC was like, but the bag. And he was like, 
when you put it like that, money talk, bullshit walk. <laughs> Let me stay my ass at Oklahoma until he got traded. So I just think that they don't want to take that risk of possibly someone giving Oladipo way more money than they can feasibly manage, especially now that they have to pay Bam mm-hmm. and that they have to pay Jimmy, etc. So I think that you go after him now and you make a huge run. Right. And this is a this is a move that I think takes the heat from being like, yo, they're really good. Can they do it again to the heat? Are almost favorites to be in the Eastern Conference Finals against someone most likely Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Right. I think it's just like it kind of changes the dynamic that you expect from this team. This team is already extremely good defensively, right? They have added Ariza, which will boost their defense. They have Jimmy. They have Bam. And that can kind of give them a lot of movement and switching. They should, in my opinion, get off Avery Bradley, who's been hurt most of the year, cannot really perform for them the way they want him to. And then maybe also, and I think this is the thing that's going to hurt them, possibly Kelly Olenek. And then it's probably also a pick. And I think that Houston wants to move Oladipo because they don't think they can keep him. Which he opted out, right? Or he said uh, they offered him an extension. Oh, that's right. And he said no. But like we know that like that doesn't really mean all that much because like you should wait the free agency to get more money. So it's just like if they can't keep Oladipo, which is looking like. Makes me think, why did they not take Karis Levert? Right. <laughs> which but, was what, two months ago? Yes. And which is now even worse that w- what you get back for Depot has to be Karis Levert or better. Either picks wise or players wise, which is now kind of like it puts you in an even worse spot. So, uh, look, I think this would be a good move for them. I think their offense would be extremely potent there. It gives them another big score that is not one-dimensional the way that, like, Duncan Robinson is. It still allows Tyler Hero to play the one, but then they have a lineup that's like Hero, Depot, Jimmy. If you want to put Ariza at the four, if you think Ariza should be starting, he ends up at the four, and then, bam, that's obviously Well, that's a small ball lineup. That is the current NBA. Bam is just not very large for a five. True. So it just feels like they're playing small ball lineups. And they, are they really? I mean, it's a, still a big lineup, but there's not a big really in that lineup, if that makes sense. I, I, I am with you. I, I That's going to kind of, that's, that is a perpetual problem for Miami currently. Um, Which could be a problem come playoffs. The East has a lot of bigs who are talented. Whether you're talking Joel Embiid or Giannis or KD. There's a seven fitters you have to deal with at some point if you want to get back to the finals. Okay, I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, last but not least, who are you monitoring for the buyout market? Buyout market for me has a few kind of targets on it, depending on what happens in free age or in the kind of lead up to the trade deadline. The number one is Aldridge. We've talked about that before on this show. I think he has 25 million or something like that coming to him this season. The question is, would the Spurs buy him out of? You know, what's left of that, which I think is a little over probably 11 or 12 million, or would they make some kind of deal and get him out of there to another team? I think teams will hold out thinking that the Spurs won't buy him out and will eventually just let him go or, you know, in after the trade deadline is done. And so they can pick him up with a veteran exception or something like that later on. So that is kind of the biggest buyout target I'm looking at right now. I feel very similarly about. Drummond, who no one seems like they're going to trade for just because of the contract, and then JaVale McGee. And it seems like JaVale McGee says he wants all of his bread, so he's probably going to have to wait it out, get his bread, and then go somewhere else because even if they pay him, they can't play him with all the fives that they have on that roster now. So, so far so good. I'm interested to see what the last minute moves are going to be i think um new orleans is a contender for some last minute moves i think they will be sellers in this market 
They have a trio of guards right now that we're not sure what they'll do with this year going into next year. I think they'll try to hang on to Lonzo Ball through the trade deadline, but there is a chance they could move J.J. Redick. He has value for a team that's contending. To who? I think possibly to the Lakers. Okay, I actually like that way more than I like people talking about Brooklyn. Oh, no, I don't like that. Like It's like, what the fuck does Brooklyn need more shooting for? They don't. Lakers need more shooting. I, I actually do like J.J. on the Lakers. I think that he would look fantastic playing off the ball next to Brown. Absolutely. So yeah. that would be another one on my radar. Okay. All right, that's that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Uh, that's our trade deadline you know, news. The fly route pod. The fly route pod. The fly. All right. Let's get into the RPO run pass options segment. It's where we give you the biggest headlines in sports news and let you know whether we are going to run with them or pass on them. Demarcus, honestly, take us away because I've had enough. I know you've had enough, and we're going to go right to the scene of the crime, so to speak, Chicago. So this past week, I guess couple yesterday, really, the Chicago Bears signed former Dallas Cowboys quarterback and Bengals quarterback Andy Dalton to a one-year $10 million contract. They still have Nick Foles in the building. As a Chicago fan, I know you are heartbroken. What is your take on the Dalton signing runner pass? Okay, I'm going to run with this, and I, I want to be mad at the Chicago front office for not getting Russell Wilson right now. Obviously, they we, we feel like we were promised Russell Wilson, even though we were not promised him. But I'm not mad at the Chicago front office because of that. Mostly because it is reported that they offer three first-round picks, a second-round pick, and two starter-level players for Russell Wilson. And the Seahawks would not budge. Mm-hmm. At that point, look. Ryan Pace has done his job. He should he should have kept pushing. And even now, he should keep pushing, right? But it's clear that Ryan Pace has done his job vis-a-vis trying to get Russell Wilson out of Seattle and into Chicago. Ryan Pace has done his job as far as trying to get Russell Wilson out of Seattle and into Chicago. What does frustrate me is that then we went and signed Andy Dalton. Which is just like... (laughs) It's very meh. He doesn't give us much more than Foles does. He has less of an aura or a mystique around him than Foles does, right? He doesn't seem to galvanize players in the way that we think Foles does, especially the way they talked about him in Philly. And I just don't know what he gives us that we did not have before. It feels like a very low ceiling pick when there were very high ceiling, interesting options that were still out there. Like I will 100% right now say I would have rather had us make the move at Jameis Winston. Oh, absolutely. It's a a higher ceiling. Yes. It's a higher ceiling. I would have 100% rather had that be the case. And I'm pretty sure we could have gotten him for cheaper. Absolutely. Uh, I don't think the rust move was ever going to happen. Even him tr- getting traded from Seattle triggers $30 million in dead cap space for them. So I don't think even with what they wanted to offer, it was going to happen. I'm hearing rumors Pete Carroll just straight up blocked it himself. was like, no, you can't trade him. But the second thing is there were lots of high quality options out there that they didn't make including like even in Marcus Mariota. That's not a high quality option. But it gives us something different than Foles, right? I I, I would have actually still been less (laughs) frustrated if we signed Marcus Mariota. So you are not wrong (laughs) in saying that. Um, But let's let's go ahead and I would have been less frustrated if we got Sam Darnold. Okay, that move would actually be really good. I'll say. Darnold is a really good talent who's been stuck in New York. Free Sam Darnold. But... I don't. I didn't see that happen. New York needs all the quality players they can get. You might have been able to get Darnold for like a second in a player or just a second. Now, speaking of quality players, the Arizona Cardinals are out in the desert stockpiling wide receivers. 
Um, they've made a recent move to sign AJ Green. They have, you know, D Hop still out there. And if Larry Fitzgerald comes back, Kyler Mary has an array of options out there in the desert to throw to. What are what is your take on these moves by Arizona thus far in free agency, run and pass? So I'm gonna pass. Even though Arizona has had an amazing free agency, like they got JJ Watt, they just took Matt Prater from the Lions, who's a great kicker. They got AJ Green, who is on a reasonable contract and has a lot of upside if he can bounce back. It's just like, look, the Cardinals already had a fire passing attack when they had just D Hop and Fitz. Adding AJ Green could be great. It could increase that exponentially. But that is yet to be seen because AJ Green has not really been healthy. And honestly, like, are they still the worst team in their division? Oh, yeah. They still are. Maybe Fitz can share whatever he's been drinking, the secret juice or whatever, for AJ to stay healthy. But something that we've talked about a little bit already, back to the N- or you know, with the NFL sliding over to New England, they've made a lot of moves, handed out 220 plus million in contracts. Does this make New England a playoff team again? And if so, where do you, where's their kind of ceiling at? Run or pass? Uh, run on New England being a playoff team by far. Uh, I, I honestly think that this is a team that's better from top to bottom. Their defense got a lot better. They, we got Cal Vanoy. They got Matthew Judon. They got, uh, what's his name? Um, the receivers. No, I'm talking about their defense cornerback. Uh, I want to say his last name is Campbell. It's just, um, what's up? No, Jalen Mills. Is what oh, I'm Mills. About. Yes, Jalen yes. Mills is who I'm thinking about. Like they got all that back. They got their opt out outs back in. Patrick Chung, High Tower. It's just like. This is the perfect storm for a Patriots bounce back season. This is a easy situation where you might see yourself seeing Patrick Mahomes go toe to toe with so Billy B again. Championship game? It's I think it's it is possible and it is not unlikely. Especially it is possible and not unlikely. I at least see them making the playoffs, definitely with the wider format. At the very least. Okay, now let's switch over to the association. So let's talk about our possible but unlikely dark horse MVP candidates in the NBA. Who you got? Okay, so it's funny because a couple of days ago I made this joke on Twitter uh, when like the Heat got to the fifth seed, and I was like, at "What seed does the Jimmy Butler dark horse MVP conversation start?" Two days later. It is full on fire, going nuts. But regardless, I can't give it to him. It's James Harden. And I think people have James Harden at like a dark horse area right now because people do not want to give him the credit for what he has done this season because of how he had to do it. But I don't think it matters based off how he had to do it because the play on the court speaks for itself. He is basically averaging a triple-double. He's like maybe like a rebound-ish, shy, a little bit less, but he's averaging 25 points, 11 assists. He is basically a monster at this point. And it is kind of undeniable seeing them go like 15-1 and one in their last 16 games without KD for most of that. And he is just leading this team. I mean, I'm going to harp on this again, but you remember when we gave Russell Westbrook a MVP just for averaging a triple-double and being like, what, the sixth seed? Mm Mm-hmm. Brooklyn might be the one seed. With KD barely playing and Harden averaging a triple-double and transforming his game in a way people like you did not think he would be able to do. I was harping on it. Like people yes. like you, that was a lot of people. That was my reason why I wasn't sure if Brooklyn could reach their ceiling. I have other reasons for pause now, including the KD injury. But yes, James Harden has been, he has transformed in a way that most NBA analysts, people who get paid to do this, did not see coming. They were not sure if he was willing to. And he has done it beautifully and very well. My Dark Horse candidate's a little bit different. 
not quite the mold, not quite the narrative of other players. But uh, my dark horse is Nikola Jokic with the Niver Nuggets. His numbers are fantastic. He's averaging a triple-double, essentially. Uh, his exact numbers are 27, 11, and 8, which is 8.5, which is pretty close to triple-double. He can get there. He has the highest PER in the league at like 31.6. Um, the Denver Nuggets are not quite doing as well um, as they have in years past, but he is the reason why they are still a, a, a key contender out in the West. Not quite the narrative, which is usually what shapes the MVP race a lot. We're, we're at this point with the Embiid injury thinking the most likely guy is LeBron. Um, mostly also part of it is narrative of people like, how could we all agree for much of the past decade he is clear in a way the best player in LeBron, but he doesn't have an MVP. And so that kind of narrative kind of drives the story forward, and there's not that kind of narrative for a guy like Harden necessarily in Brooklyn or um, out in Denver at all. LeBron has showed us every postseason that he is basically the best player on the planet. Not in every regular season, though. And I think, especially not having AD and keeping the Lakers afloat is important, but he's faltered without AD, though. Mm -hmm. Like, it's been a real faltering. It's not that LeBron is not amazing. It's not that he's not great. It's not that when the playoffs hit, you know, he'll go zero dark 30 and take it to a new level. We know that. I do not know if it is as impactful or as valuable as what we are seeing other players do for their teams. I do think if LeBron wasn't on the Lakers, they wouldn't be a playoff team. They like they they would be where the Kings were. And maybe if that's the truth, maybe we he should, should get it. I mean, like I said, he hasn't won one in like eight years. Mm-hmm. So maybe he's also just whether I hate this or not, do for one, considering who he is. We'll see. I think LeBron has opened the door for guys like Harden or Jokic, but it's going to all, I think, be about the narrative before the season ends. As we know, uh, NBA reporters vote on this, I think, before the playoffs begin. And so nothing in the playoffs will ever influence this, or at least the coming up playoffs. Certainly the patch playoffs do influence it, which is why Giannis will not win another MVP until he does well in the playoffs, no matter how good he does in the regular season. All right, I'm with you. Let's stick with the NBA for a little bit here. The first NBA players have actually been vaccinated, uh, and they are members of the Pelicans. In fact, uh, New Orleans and Louisiana widened their restrictions for who can get the vaccine. It made a number of eligible players on the Pelicans eligible. Uh, Several of them, almost all of them, got the vaccine, and... For me, I'm asking you, do you think this will become part of a larger movement for player acceptance and actually wanting to get the vaccine? Run or pass? I'll run. I'll say, yes, it will become a part of a larger movement for players to get the vaccine, but not for any necessarily, in this instance, programmed or targeted campaign by the NBA or any group of people. This is, I think, going to happen much more organically then people are thinking it's not going to have the level of planning that we maybe want it to have. Cause we're like, Hey, going to the playoffs, we can convince 90% of players to get the vaccine. You know, that means that hopefully no series will be impacted by a COVID protocol pool. Like we wouldn't want LeBron being pulled in the conference finals for contact tracing, right? That would be devastating for the league. And so we're hoping that maybe more people do get it for that reason, but this is going to happen much more organically these players are not jumping in line. Like you said, Louisiana expanded their eligibility and players, even though they're professional athletes, sometimes qualify as overweight or obese. And that's how a lot of them are going to qualify to get the vaccine in their states. That is actually the identifier that allowed several Pelicans to get in. All right. I'm going to move us back to football. I want to talk about Russell Okung. And he is now one of the highest 30 highest paid NFL players. He was a person that took, uh, I want to say, a large portion of his contract as Bitcoin instead of cash. And it went from being about $13 million to $21 million since he signed the contract. Do you think this is like, A, something that's sustainable, but B, something that we might see more often? 
run or pass? I'll run. Yes, I think we will see it more often. It's a way for both the team to say, hey, here's your cap number and it'd be lower, but a player to actually get more money than they are kind of going to count against the cap, which is a great workaround for lots. And now it's not a guarantee, which is why it's risky, but it's a great workaround for both teams and players who want to maximize their potential earnings. Uh, for the Okun, this worked out because the value of Bitcoin increased since he signed the contract. And as long as it is even a penny more than it was when he signed it, he will be winning this this deal. Um, I do think we will see more players do this as Bitcoin and other digital currencies become much more of the norm and value keeps increasing. There's only so much Bitcoin out there. And so it looks likely that value will keep increasing. Okay. All right. So last but not least, Fitzmagic, Ryan Fitzpatrick is now the new quarterback of the Washington football team. He's now throwing at Terry McLaurin and recently signed old Panthers receiver Curtis Samuels. Do you think Fitzmagic can lead the Washington football team to their second straight NFC East crown? Run or pass? So pass and it's a hell no. Um, The Cowboys had their quarterback back and Dak. The Giants have made improvements to the roster with Daniel Jones. I think both of those teams are more likely to win the division or be in the hunt than Washington, even with their great defense. Fitzmagic is inconsistent. He is inconsistent, which is why he is known as Fitzmagic and not Fitz, the all-pro quarterback who's been on one team. (laughs) (laughs) That's That's my take. (laughs) He's been on 17 teams. You have to ask yourself, there's got to be a reason for that. Okay. He's inconsistent. He has his huge peaks, but he has deep, deep valleys that last a long time, too. So if you think that he can be more valley than than or more peak than valley, sure, go for it. But even then, you still got the Cowboys to contend with and in a much closer race, which I think they'll still win. But I think he's going to be much more. for like more. two straight years. Not been trash. Okay. Last year, we literally lost our quarterback in half of our team. Okay. And the year before that, we were in the playoffs. No, the year before that, you were not in the playoffs. Philly beat you oh, game I'm sorry. 16, and they got to the playoffs. Eight and eight on one. But that was, that's not trash to be playing in the last game of the season with the playoffs on the line. That is disappointing. <laughs> that's for sure. That is heartbreaking. Not trash, though. I'll defend that. Uh, okay. All right. I'm going to let you have it. I'm going to let you have it. I, I, I think they got something cooking up there down in Washington. All right. That was your RPO. It's a a Playboy affair. Welcome to the final segment of our show, the heart of our show, Ballers Bouquets. Too often in the media, people only want to focus on the negative and salacious things athletes do and never want to give them their credit where credit is due. Here, we like to make a change. Absolutely. And we, like we said before, we love to give our roses while people can still smell them. And this week, we're going to look at what a very popular, very good NBA player has done with the downtime he has had with both the combination of the pandemic and a recent injury this NBA season. So we're going to go up to Portland and this week's Ballers Bouquet is going to go to Yusuf Nurkic. So uh, Yusuf was born in 94, shout out, He in Bosnia. That, for that country in Eastern Europe, was a very tumultuous time. It was during a war, Bosnian War. And that has made a huge impact on the person that Yusuf is today. And he goes back home often. He's one of the players who, you know, when the quarantine stuff happened and we were talking about getting the bubble back, it was like, are you going to be able to get back in time through all the quarantines? And so he really loves his country and spends time, as much time in there as he possibly can. And he's noticed inequalities and problems that he wants to help out in, especially as a result of COVID. So, but even before COVID, there are problems like, for example, it can take a woman up to two years to get a mammogram, which is a normal annual screening for breast cancer and highly, highly effective at reducing the death rates and catching it early. But if you have to wait up to two years, you can't really catch it that early at all. And so he and his or his foundation worked with the Bosnian government to you know, have a whole slew of charitable acts to help the healthcare industry and families in Bosnia. 
used to have donated in his organization over $50,000 in PPE uh, to area hospitals. He donated $40,000 to have the roof of the hospital repaired in his hometown, which is also the largest hospital in his hometown. Donated mammogram machines. Uh, I want to say built and paid for three homes for single mothers and their families. Just this whole slew of charitable events that are, that are going to have a huge impact on his community in Bosnia. Um, you know, when asked about this particular, you know, set of charitable acts, he talked about his connection to the war, but also the fact that he just wants to do his part to help give back. Um, I believe he said, quote, um, it was just tough, no chance, no opportunities, etc." And so I think, at least for me, having someone who maybe I didn't live through a war, but, you know, having lived through poverty in America is pretty rough, too. What? What? That was some real first world shit, nigga. You said, yo, look, I haven't lived this civil war. But poverty in America is kind of the same thing. Poverty and being black in America is pretty rough. Look, look, I am with you. Being black in America is tough. Being poor anywhere is tough. I, I, the equivalence of just like, <laughs> it was funny to be in the moment. Well, just to say that the... Whenever you go through something when you are young, whether it is learning about the racism of the world and social and structural inequality or living and seeing a war in your country for your country and for your people, it's going to impact you. Those are for children, traumatic events, even if they're not the same. A hundred percent. And so very much I am in the same vein as him that when you go through something like that, you don't want to see that happen again and you want to do everything in your power to prevent that from happening to other people if you can. And so his ability to give back, to help the healthcare people in his country and to speak out about, you know, kind of shine a light on more people in this world who need help is super, super important. We want to give him a huge shout out for that. It like, it is tough out here. There are different levels of tough, but it is tough out here. And so him going home to help people who look like him, who can connect with him, who have the same story or background as him. is super, super important, super critical. Every week during this bouquet, we talk about people who've given back, but I can't say that anyone has had as close of a connection and reason to give back as Yusuf has in this instance, because that is devastating on, on so many fronts. Because when you have a war, your country can't focus on healthcare. That's not a priority at all. And though the war would happen in the 90s, those ripple effects are still being felt today. That's less than 30 years ago, right? And so it seems, oh, it's a long time ago, 94, any millennials and Gen Z people, they're like, oh, it's a long time ago. But it's not really in terms of the world and how countries work and how these things happen and occur. And so huge, huge shout out to uh, Yusuf for doing this. I also hope that he comes back from this wrist surgery he had in January to help the Trailblazers make their little playoff push. With, for Dame Lillard, um, that would be something good to happen to him personally. And I think that uh, with his uh, charitable acts, he certainly deserves something good to happen to him. And so, I mean, that's our bouquet. Y'all, y'all, y'all is Tony Playboy. All right, that's it for episode 27. As always, we want to thank each and every yeah, yeah, yeah. single one of you, whether you're a first time listener, you've been listening since episode one. You like really the novels money some time along the way. Well, I mean, we love I the fact that you all really spend time with That's actually funny. I, I guess I can't can, believe honestly, I laughed. I was like, I don't think the comp, people laugh. The comp was too ridiculous. Your continued support means everything. Uh, and you and As you always, in the moment laughing made me feel like it was, and I was like, hold on. Sports questions and things. Because the full quote like from him is like, covered. Uh, we were you poor, there's children in Boston who went to Instagram, which is totally Twitter, true. People here. Facebook, <laughs> at the Fly I, I, Rock Pod. I, 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 like, all one you just played yourself. I was like, that is reasonable. From it was just funny to compare <laughs> war to him. You are watching this. I mean, on, make sure that you like there, and I would argue both their forms of war. Make sure you don't miss <laughs> They just look a little different. If you're watching uh, us what, on YouTube, one make sure you also hit the notification yes. bell. <laughs> yes. You don't miss. One's been videos. happening for a lot longer, too. Like, like, like one involves rule of law. The, the other one involves the lack of it. not be a part of our normal podcast. Yes. Whether That's or not that law <laughs> is <laughs> racist and violent and, and super devastating to black people does not negate the fact that there is a rule of law. The Fly Rap Podcast.
Well, we want to thank you all for taking yes. the time I'll like, say that. Yeah. Yeah. to this video. We, we don't have enough time to tackle this inequality video around the world. Of the largest <laughs> fly around podcast. I feel like we Look should us put up this wherever into you the watch podcasts. We are on Spotify, Apple oh. Music, uh, everywhere. Take the time, subscribe. Uh, we appreciate you. While we have you here, don't forget to like this video. <laughs> it's like five minutes ago. Button. And while you're at it, you don't forget to hit the notification bell. Just Otherwise, the you'll miss time. some of our YouTube videos. That's just the way YouTube okay. works. And uh, don't good. forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at uh, the Fly Route Pod. All right, all right.